Hi, I'm Dr. Paris. I'm the instructor for a series of videos that's intended to help you study for Actual Exam FM. Uh, I've got the videos split up uh, in such a way that there are four modules, or modules are like chap chapters, so four chapters. Uh, again, I'm going to call them modules. And each module consists of sections. Uh, so there will be module, this is being the first video, will be module one, section one. Some of the sections get kind of long, so I split them up into parts. This is one such section, so this is module one, section one, part one. A natural place to start the study of this, uh, of, of this course, this material, is with the time value of money. And a natural way to illustrate the time value of money is with a timeline. So timelines are nothing more than number lines. On the bottom of the number line goes a time value, so you may start, say, with time zero. And then later on you'll have the time k value, and then after that maybe a time n value. The units along the timeline, common units that you're going to see are going to be years, or months, or quarters, or semi-annual periods. Those are very common uh, uh, values, uh, or units that you'll use along the timeline. Um, and, and maybe even something like biannual periods. I wanted to put in biannual periods because uh, biannual period means every two years, once every two years. Semi-annual periods means every six months, once every six months, or twice a year. Biannual periods means once every two years. So keep that in mind. I want to also illustrate that you know the, the values on the timeline are kind of irrelevant in the sense that you want to pick a value and then or pick a time unit and then just be consistent throughout the problem. So for instance, you might see a problem where the time unit is 12 day periods. Uh, well, really, you're not gonna see a problem like that, but uh, this is, I've never seen 12 day periods. You're not gonna see 12 day periods as a unit on the timeline. I don't think you're, you'll ever choose that as one of your time units, but who knows, I might be wrong. My point though is it doesn't matter what the, what the time units are as long as you're consistent throughout the problem uh, using the same time units. Uh, so let's go back to, a, to an example where, uh, say, I've got a time unit in years, or, or let's say you read a problem and you think, I'm going to use time units of years, and you've got uh, an information on the problem that leads you to, to use time units of zero years, three years, and seven years. Now, I might read the same problem, and a natural choice for me on that problem would be to use months. That's fine. There's no problem. You didn't do it wrong. I didn't do it wrong. We're, we're good. But, of course, I wouldn't have the time 0, 3, and 7 values. I would have times 0, 36, and 84 values because I'm using months and you're using years. So, again, the point is uh, you can use whatever values you want on the timeline. Just be consistent. Whatever units you want on the timeline, just be consistent with, with, uh, with, with what you're doing. Okay, now there's another part of the timeline. On the bottom go the time units. On the top go the dollar amount. So I have this dollar symbol uh, up there. And so, for instance, at time K, I might have a dollar amount capital X. Now, a little uh, uh, comment on, on terminology. Uh, I'm going to say the word cap to, to abbreviate the word capital. So I'm going to get tired of saying capital X, capital Y, capital W. So I'm just going to say cap X. So I'm saying the word C-A-P, cap, as an abbreviation of the word capital. So I've got cap X dollars at time K. Another uh, uh, comment here is that the dollar sign that I have next to the cap X uh, symbol is kind of it, it, you know redundant because on top of the timeline go the capital the the dollar cent amounts. So the capital X is understood to have a dollar. So I'm just not going to write it. Usually the capital letters like cap X, cap Y, cap W, those are going to represent uh, dollar amounts and the lowercase letters like a Z, like a K and an N are going to represent um, uh, time values. Okay, so the idea with the time value of money is that if you have some dollar amount cap X at time K and you move that forward in time, say to time N, well you're not going to have the same amount cap. Uh, you're not going to have the same cap X value. Uh, for instance, if if you if you lend me a hundred dollars today and I'm going to pay you back in a year, are you going to, are you going to allow me to pay you back the same dollar amount? Uh, and, and if so, then I'm going to give you my phone number. I want you to call me because uh, I want to do some business with you. I don't want to just borrow $100. for. I want to borrow all of your money because I'm going to take your money and I'm going to put it in an, in a, in an interest-bearing account. I'm going to earn interest, and then I'm going to keep the interest and pay you back. 
So the point is, that's, that's the whole idea of the time value of money. It's very simple, is that over the course of time, you can earn, you're going to earn interest on your money. So at time, at time in, I wouldn't have the same dollar amount cap X. I'd have some other amount cap Y. Uh, and now we would say, well, of course, we, we already said that cap Y is not equal to cap X, but we, we would say that cap Y is equivalent to cap X. So the amount cap X at time K is equivalent to the amount uh, cap Y at, at time N. Uh, and I mentioned this before, that I'm going to take your money and I'm going to put it into a uh, into a, uh, uh, an interest-bearing account. I'm going to earn some interest and pay you back. So I'm, I'm, I'm pay you back, you know, your dollar amount, and then I'm going to keep the interest. In other words, what I'm saying is we're going to assume that the dollar amount cap Y is bigger than the dollar amount cap X. Now, you might be ahead of me a little bit. You might be saying, well, wait a minute. I might take that money and, and invest it like in the stock market in some risky investment where there's a chance that I might lose, lose some money and, and so the, the dollar amount cap Y might be less than the dollar amount cap X. You're completely right. That's true. And we're going to address that situation in module four. But until we get to module four, we're going to assume that the investments that we're putting this money in are like just safe, very safe, interest bearing investments. And so the dollar amount Y is more than the dollar amount X. We're going to make that assumption until we get to, to module four, we'll make, make that assumption. Okay, some other words, some other comments about, about terminology. When we move money forward in time, we say that we accumulate the money. And so we would call Y the accumulated value of cap X. So moving money forward in time is accumulating, Y is the accumulated value of X. On the other hand, if I move money backward in time, we're going to say that that's discount. We're discounting, and we would call, y, uh, we would call X, <clears throat> excuse me, the discounted value of cap Y. So X, let me get caught up here. X is, cap X is called the discounted value of cap Y. There's a special case that if we discount all the way back to time zero, and in that case, we call cap X the present value of cap Y. Now, our, our general timeline, again, looks like this. And so for the rest of the video here, I'm going to be interested in trying to relate the cap X and the cap Y values. I know that they're not equal to each other. So how do we mathematically relate the two, the two values? Okay, so here's what we, we generally do. Uh, let's say that I know the cap X value and I want to know what can I do to the cap X value to get the cap Y value. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the cap X value by something called a periodic accumulation factor. Look at, the, well, before I, I get to uh, uh, more on the, the wording, periodic accumulation factor, let me mention my notation here. This is not standard notation. You're not expected to know this sort of stuff for the exam. However, it's, it, it's uh, notation that I've come up with that will help you understand the material. Uh, and so later on, we'll get into some notation that is ex that you are expected to know on the exam. You're not expected to know this notation, but I strongly encourage you to use this notation. It will help you uh, uh, under understand the material. I'm also using notation that you've seen before uh, in integral calculus. If you're looking at, at, at calculating an integral from, from A to B of some function, you put the A as a subscript and the B as a superscript. You're going from A, A is the subscript, to B, the B is a superscript. So I'm doing the same thing here. If you look at this a periodic accumulation uh, factor uh, symbol that I have, that second factor, uh, the PAF, I'm using a subscript of K because I'm moving the X value from time K and a superscript of N because I'm moving it to time N. Okay, now let's unwind the words a little bit. Uh, the PAF from time k to time n is a periodic accumulation factor from time k to time n. The word factor here, mathematically, the word factor means you're multiplying by it. And that's what we're doing. We're multiplying cap x by this factor. It's a factor to do what? Well, it's a factor to accumulate. So it's an accumulation factor. And you're accumulating where? Well, you're accumulating over the period from time k to time n. So uh, that should make it should make sense to you then that 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 hopefully this is you've got some intuition now on this and this uh, this is a natural choice of words to use. Now instead of uh, accumulating, I could have done the same thing with discounting, and and so in this in my general picture here, I'm thinking of what if I know the cap y value? How will I get the cap x value from the cap y value? 
And so I would multiply the cap Y value by not a periodic, periodic accumulation function, but a periodic disc, not a periodic accumulation factor, but a periodic discount factor. So again, unwind the words. Uh, the PDF from N to K would be the factor. The F is the factor. I'm multiplying cap X, I'm sorry, I'm multiplying cap Y by this factor. It's a, it's a, a factor that I'm multiplying to do what? I'm multiplying in order to discount. And over what period? Over the period from time N back to time K. So it's a periodic discount factor from time n back to time k. So I've got these, these two factors then. I've got a periodic accumulation factor. If I want to move money forward in time, I have a periodic discount factor if I want to move money backwards in time. Now, uh, I've got a couple of remarks on this. Let's look at some, uh, some remarks that, that are needed in, in order for us to have a, a consistent system here. The first remark is that if I take the periodic accumulation factor from time k to time n and I multiply that times a periodic discount factor from time n back to time k, well what have I done? I've taken an amount that I've accumulated from time n to time k and then, I, and then I'm going to take that same amount and discount it back from time n back to time k. Well I better, I better get back to the same amount that I started with otherwise I don't have a consistent system and that will force this product of periodic accumulation factor from k to n with the periodic discount factor from n back to time k to be one it forces that to be one. I want to rewrite that in a in a uh, uh, an equivalent way for for later on that I'll use later on. So I'll write it this way that the periodic accumulation factor from time k to time n. All I'm doing is solving for that uh, for that factor, and that would be one divided by the periodic discount factor from time n back to time k. In other words, these, these uh, factors uh, uh, over the, the proper time periods are just reciprocals of one another. The other uh, comment that I have to make, or the other, uh, the other remark that I have to make, has to do with what if there's an inter intermediate time. So what if I wanted to accumulate in this picture from time k to time r? I had the, the x value that I wanted to accumulate to, from time k to time r. Well, I could do it two ways. On, on the left-hand side of this equation in red, I have a periodic accumulation factor from time k to time r, so that's what I would multiply x by in order to accumulate from time k to time r directly. Or I could accumulate uh, to time r indirectly by first accumulating from time k to time n, so I would multiply by what's in blue here, the periodic accumulation factor from time k to time n, and then take that amount and accumulate it from time n to time r, so that's multiplying by what's in black here, the periodic accumulation factor from time n to time r. So hopefully that makes sense to you. And not only could I do this for accumulation factors, but I could also do this for, for discount factors. Uh, the di periodic discount factor from R back to time K, that would be in red, that would be directly a, a discounting from time R back to time K. Or I could discount from time R back to time N by using a periodic discount factor from time R to time N and then multiplying that by taking that value and discounting it from time N back to time K by, by multiplying by what's in blue there. Okay, so the last uh, slide here has uh, just both facts on one page. There's one more fact that I want to, uh, to discuss uh, in, in involving these uh, periodic accumulation factors and periodic discount factors, but uh, that, that fact is so important I'm going to put it in its own video and it actually uses notation that's going to be used on not only the rest of the uh, FM exam, but on all the exams going forward. And so it's very important. Uh, I want to put it in its own video. And so I'll see you in the next video and we'll discuss that fact.